Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for our cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it is saving us hours from basic inventory management to calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves. Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also work with multiple supply chains to offer alternative marketing outlets for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data back on our calves to help us make informed breeding choices for the next year. To learn more, head to their website, breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is in the show notes. Why did you choose to start NODAC Meats? So I ended up starting it based on local demands of the, the local guys here. Um, being new to steel, I ended up running around and getting to know a couple of farmers and they all said the same thing. You know, they didn't recognize, recognize who I was. Um, so then I introduced myself, told them I was cutting meat at the time that they needed a local processor and that, you know, wait times were so long um, that they had to, you know, drive the animals so far in order to get it done on a timely matter. So with so many people saying the same thing, the light bulb kind of went off to uh, pursue it a little bit harder and, you know, get the financing available or in line is what I could. And with a little help from the city of Steel. And then the state of North Dakota also pitched in a little bit to uh, to make it happen, and and here we are. So you were cutting meat prior to this, or what did life look like prior to you starting this venture? Yeah, so actually I had, going through high school and college, I had nothing to do with cutting meat except other than, you know, deer kills and stuff like that with, with uh, cutting with dad and, and family and brothers and stuff. Um, I pursued a different thing in college, and then it came through... Um, a few years after college, I ended up cutting meat on Fridays um, with a four-day work week and enjoyed it. I really liked it, and the day went by really fast. So I ended up pursuing that all week or as a full-time job, um, and I learned from a, an older gentleman that's been doing it for 52-some years, 53 years, and knew every trick in the book. I mean, it was, you do this because you do this, and, and this happens because of that, and it was all kinds of good training that that he provided me so I carried on with that and actually liked it and then uh, after making the move from Minnesota out here to steel and then that's kind of all that snowball started rolling and got into this so so did you have any like connection to steel outside of hunting in the area no it was kind of a unique story how it came together um, I met a gal back in Minnesota and her parents were actually from Hazen North Dakota and Fort Yates and they were kind of in the retirement setting of coming back to North, North Dakota to retire. So um, with that being said, I like to hunt out here. Um, our family came out here and hunted when I was younger, so it didn't really seem very bizarre. And we ended up following her job here in Bismarck and looking at a house in Steel, Bismarck and Washburn, and then that's how we ended up buying a house in Steel and, and ended up in Steel. It was, there was really no rhyme or reason to come here, but it was uh, it's a good place so. it, it is a good town I guess right. it's my hometown but yeah. maybe well sometimes you have different feelings about your hometown than people <laughs> who move in but it's a it's a good community and I know I actually used to live not far from right where we're recording this today in your facilities just around the corner and uh, it was it was cool to watch this building take make progress as you were um, building it and getting started so we're recording this in April of 2024. Right. When did you open officially? So we actually started building. They poured concrete on the 4th of July or the weekend of the 4th of July and it took about five months to complete. It was actually very fast. It's a pretty simple building in general um, but then it went up fairly fast and I ended up started killing beef just before Christmas. Um, make sure my setup worked and everything you know, went smoothly and the first couple were were unique. Um, you know, I made some tweaks and some adjustments to the slaughter floor and some different things. Um, I did not have it nailed down by any means. But then, yeah, I officially opening in uh, the 8th of January, so I've been doing it for now three months here and getting a routine down. And I've done about 65 animals so far. Um, that's where we're at. What's your capacity for how many animals you can 
do at a time or hang. So, so be, this facility specifically can probably hold at one time about 40-ish animals. Um, and that's being in quarters in beef. Um, with you know other hogs, of course, would, would fit as well. But 40 animals or so in the coolers at one time um, for storage reasons. And then, you know, the freezer can hold a few too. Um, but you can really only slaughter as many animals as you can cut up during the week because it's all a it's all a system is what that's why they call it processing it is a process of you know whatever you can cut up in one day is what you can technically kill in one day so if you can only cut up two beef in one day with the help that you have is is about what you're limited to kill per day or per week for the facility so how long are you able to let carcasses hang if people want like a longer hang time yeah so depending if the animal is grass-fed or grain finished um, grass-fed animals I like to, to cut up right at the two-week mark or even before with no fat cap on the outside um, that meat starts to age faster and actually that that age will penetrate the outside of the carcass a little bit more and create kind of a black a black aging it's just an oxidization thing um, that that the carcass goes through and it, that outside layer of, of meat doesn't taste good so when the when the processor gets it out onto the floor they have to cut that off and the longer you let a grass-fed animal hang, just the more you lose. Now, with a grain-finished animal with a fat cap on the outside or a fatty animal, that I'll hang at least two weeks, if not three. Anything over three is okay. Um, it still works. You can hang them for a month or even longer if you really have the right setup and the right humidity. Um, moisture is always an issue in facilities or coolers as the actual carcass is losing moisture as it's aging. Um, so there's some, there's some things to work out there, but... I like to do two to three weeks. Okay, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, after your first couple animals, it was a learning curve. You made some tweaks and adjustments after that. What were some of those tweaks and adjustments? Um, so the first couple were actually the actual kill shoot. Um, the animal comes off the trailer from the farm or goes into a shoot and then comes up to a head gate. And I compensated that shoot to be about 32 inches wide or almost 34 inches wide, which is about six inches too wide. Um, a beef animal, even a big, large beef animal, is actually narrower than what a person thinks or what they can fit through. Um, I compensated for that, and now some of these smaller animals, there's too much space going on, and it's giving the cattle too much option to, uh, to be a pain, basically. Um, some of the other stuff was uh, my crane hoist worked just fine. It's on an I-beam, and basically the trolley does, does not lock so i had to put in a brace for that in order to pull the animal out onto the skinning cradle um, that was just a simple simple adjustment but but that was probably about it i guess so far so what would you say your biggest challenge was overall with getting this whole business started um Probably the beginning of it was just the financing. I mean, everybody's going to have trouble with financing because it's, you know, it's a larger dollar amount, especially being younger. Um, there was a lot of hoops to jump through in a couple different agencies and banks and stuff that, you know, an average person goes to to, to do something like this and start a business. Um, and it over, overall, in the end, it worked out really well, um, just the way that it came together. And... You know, interest rates and financing and stuff is, is very important in a small business in order to make that that work financially. And, yeah, simple as that is. The hardest part was probably the financing. And then once those grants came through and uh, utilizing your resources is a big one um, for anybody starting a business is utilize resources. Don't just necessarily go to a bank and try to find the funding. Um, there is other outside investors and resources and stuff that you can use, even nonprofit agencies that will help you um, pursue something that you're trying to get after. That, thank you for sharing that. I know we've, that's actually a topic that I've had on the show before is there yeah. are alternative funding options outside of just traditional bank loans. Right, right. It's so more than a guy thinks. Yeah. What about the labor standpoint? How many employees do you have here? What does that look like? And was it a challenge to find workers? Yeah, so being in a rural setting uh, that I kind of expected help to be an issue, of course, in today's world and the labor markets, it's, it's very difficult in a rural area. And 
I kind of designed this place to start out being a one-man team. Um, myself running it for now is actually the only help that I have except an exceptional um, couple part-timers that came in and, and do come in and help debone and Grindberger and, and process kind of a couple days a week. Um, there are some farmers that are, you know, not necessarily active in the winter time when it's when everything's frozen, so they do assist um, a little bit and that's pretty much it. I mean, it's it's definitely a challenge being a one-man show. Hey ranchers, which topic interests you the most? Adding value to your calf, cover crops, finding and retaining employees or interns, improving business management, or maybe even creating multiple revenue sources for your ranch? All of these are conversations that we have had or are planning to have on Rancher Minds this year. Rancher Minds is a group of cattle producers who meet online once a month to visit with industry experts during small group Q&A sessions. The small groups make sure your questions get addressed and the recordings ensure you never miss a thing, even if the cows get out. You can join us from the pasture, field, office, or vehicle. If you're interested in learning more, head to my website and use the contact us feature and I'll email you back. So with that, you were talking about beef a lot, obviously, because this right. is a cattle podcast, but what other animals are you open to processing here? Yeah, so I've done a few hogs. Um, that's kind of basic. And, you know, this is the time of year opening in January, you know, deer season is, is over and wild game season is pretty much over. Um, I haven't gotten into too much retail of that side of it yet. There's some licensing and paperwork stuff has to be done still. And... That's probably another another big challenge of starting the place is the paperwork that's in line for the government agencies in order to do what you want to do. Um, it's not necessarily just throw together throw together products and and get them out the door. Everything is kind of monitored by the state and even federal government. So there's some there's some challenges there. Um, as far as other animals, no, it's just been primarily beef and uh, a few hogs at this point. Um, I do not I do not process any sheep lamb goats that stuff it's uh it's kind of tedious work and and i'm not completely set up for it so so you are usda inspected yes and no so this plan is actually state of the north state of north dakota department of ag um inspected but it's actually equal to usda regulations mm -hmm. so everything is, is comes down from usda or federal government um, the state Department of Ag is actually audited, and their their bosses, the federal government, make sure that they're you know employing these these rules and food safety um, things to owners like me in places like this. So, yeah, it was it's state inspected at this point. It's, Do you want to work towards that full USDA inspection label, even though like usually state inspection can be strict, is always equal to federal inspection, if not stricter, depending on the state. Are you still going to work towards that right, right. federal inspection? Federal is, and I, don't, I haven't been exposed to it yet, actually, um, to know it in and out, but federal inspection is actually somewhat simpler than state inspection. Um, the, staffing issue, the staffing issue from the federal government is its own thing, but that's kind of on them. Um, and it depends what your plant really runs through. If it's daily, if it's weekly, or you only want an inspector there monthly. Um, yeah. Okay. So obviously your one of your services you provide is the processing of animals. What else do you provide? Because I see some retail options up front here. Right, so Nodak Meats uh, here in, in a rural setting, we offer just you know the basic custom Custom processing um, is kind of the big one. That's the biggest demand. Next would be like an emergency kill, basically broken legs or animals that are still ambulatory due to you know regulations. The animal has to be up and walking in order to to consume it or to butcher it, process it. Um, and I think that's a federal rule. Um, yeah. So other than emergency kills, um, we also do go to the farm for those people that do like on the farm um, butchering. We'll take care of the animal right there. Um, with with a little help of the farmer, and then uh, lastly would be a little bit of retail. I got the pork and beef cuts um, at all times. You know the, the patties, the burgers, the steaks, um, roast, you know stew meat, cube steak, all that you know, very stuff. So, what's been the community's reaction overall to 
what you've opened up and have been providing over the last few months? I, I would say curiosity. I mean, once something in a small town pops up, it's everybody's kind of nosy. Everybody wants to know what it looks like and what uh, what's going on here. Um, other than that, I think a lot of people are happy. They're happy the service is here, that it's that it's close and not 50 miles away. Um, they are uh, they are proud. I think they want to they want to be able to have this here in town, and and it seems like the community would or will help when it's needed. So good. So now that you've been doing this for a few months now, when you think about the process from start to finish, whether that's first visiting with a potential client all the way up through processing that animal and getting that animal back to them, what is the most challenging part of that process? Um, I think so far would just be the help. Um, you know, being a one-man team, it, it presents its own challenges in, in a timely way. You know, everything, once the animal is killed, it's it's got a timeline to when that thing, that carcass can be processed. It's kind of sets a lot of deadlines, um, trying to get things done and, and in time before something either spoils or, or you know, the, the food safety, you know, as far as bacteria or, or mold or something spreading in the building and just staying on top of the overall cleanliness is is a lot of work. Um, but I think the biggest one with that would just be help. Okay. Okay, Scott. So I'm curious, you know, when we talk about processing meat, we think about the steaks, we think about the burger, we think about the roasts, but what about some of those byproducts or the rendering process? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so other than just the, the primary goodies um, of an animal, you know, there is, there is all the offal or the, uh, the organ meat on a beef specifically and, and, and pork. Um, the tongue, the heart, the tail, the liver, the, those kind of things actually are very consumable. And, and some people are sought after that. Um, it seems to be more typically the older generation and, and then the younger. However, that, that stuff ends up from this plant, it all ends up in a trailer and then ends up composting um, rurally out, 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 outside of town. Um, that compost then just breaks down over time and it's, it's utilized by the farmer for actual fertilizer. Um, it turns into kind of a, kind of a mulch. Um, once it dries out and it's, it's ready to go, it, it, the farmer can utilize it. Okay. So back to that whole process and the most challenging part of, you know, working with your clients from start to finish, what's something that cattle producers can do to communicate better, build up a strong relationship so that you still want to work with them? Yeah, so one one hurdle I've noticed already is, is communication between not necessarily the farmer and the processor, but the farmer and the customer. Let the customer know, you know, if the, if the customer can't get out to the farm and see the animal, you know, that you, you sold privately is is communicate with them on what they're getting. Are they getting a grass-fed animal? Or are they getting a grain-finished animal? You know, what's the age and the sex of the animal? Um, there's a lot of different aspects there of the quality of the animal. You know, when the customer just comes to pick up meat and, and write the check, you know, they, they want to know what they're getting. They don't want some surprise, you know, grass-fed animal if they're used to a grain finish or vice versa. Um, and then also, you know, communication when, when the animal is dropped off, if it is sold privately, is, is to have the names and the phone numbers um, of who that animal is sold to and the amount of that animal that, it's, that they're taking to the processor right there. Um, it, it eliminates a lot of hurdles and, and mis, miscommunications or, uh, and actually legally you're supposed to. I mean, bring that animal, when you bring that animal here, have it have it spoken for um, that that leaves the processor in line with with regulations and and alleviates a lot of a lot of hurdles so with that what other communication factors can ranchers do with their customers you know whether that's so that the customer understands how much meat they can expect to get back or anything along maybe some of those common misunderstandings yeah so there's <clears throat> In general, with cattle specifically, there's some standards that uh, that processors usually follow, which comes down to an actual percentage of an animal. So if if an animal is weighed out, which is pretty typical, that that uh, the customer and the farmer both charge 
well, the farmer charges, the processor charges on rail weight, which is actual hanging weight of the carcass animal after it's been slaughtered. Some people don't know that and they don't know what that is. And it's usually a percentage of beef is usually 60 to 64% or so of the hanging weight is your take home meat. Well, when that, when that hanging weight carcass is actually in the cooler, it's already losing weight. It's losing moisture and, and it's starting to dry out. So it's actually losing weight before we even cut it up. Once we cut up, you know, you have to figure in all the weight, whether you take boneless cuts, if you take bone in cuts, um, how fatty the animal was. There's a lot of different varies that, variables that affect how much take home meat you even take home off of that hanging weight. So besides the bone and the fat and, and the different stuff that we throw away on the processing floor, um, there's still other things that, that, that what, yeah, that's what gets you down to the 60%. That 40% basically ends up in the barrel and goes out the door. So if you ever end up with, with far less than that, you know, if you have a 400 pound half that you paid for at the processor and you only get 100 pounds of meat back, that's a percentage issue and you can look at that right away and go that's way less than 50 percent it should be about 60. now that that's just kind of a general usda guideline is the 60 percent now if you have a bull you know butcher bull that's going to weigh out probably at almost 70 percent if you have a really fat open heifer um, that some of these guys are that are selling you might be down all the way to 47 percent so there's a little bit of variable from 60 percent but 60 percent is your is your guideline are there any other like misconceptions that you hear from customers that you... Yeah, so when, when a customer takes it home you know, from the processor and they're putting it back in their freezer and they go, oh, I only had so many steaks, I only had this many roasts. Well, taking a factor of, of how large was the half or the animal that you bought to begin with. Um, secondly would be even how thick were your cuts. You know, do you have smaller cuts you know steaks that are three quarters of an inch you're going to end up with more steaks on an animal if you have steaks that are inch and a half thick you're not going to end up with that many steaks um, so just take into consideration of actually how you requested the animal you know for as a customer standpoint of how much meat you got back on on that so what advice do you have for anyone else who is thinking about starting their own processing operation in a small town? I would say really think it through. Um, there's, you know, it's definitely a commitment. Uh, physically, mentally, it can be draining. Um, and then of course, financially, you're committed for a while financially. And it is a prideful job. There's, you know, when people come to pick up and they're happier than a chicken to, to pick up their meat. <laughs> um, that is that is a rewarding part of the job and that's kind of what I pursued this for but it does take a toll on your body um, over time you know hopefully by the time I'm 50 I can still still walk and talk but it it's just think about it and make sure everything your gut says that it's good to go and and before you actually sign on the dotted line and that's a wrap on that one folks thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.